Now, Nick is a firm believer in the potential of Southeast Asia and its tech sector. And he will tell us why in his presentation, Southeast Asia in the spotlight of unicorns, mega exits, and the big digital advantage. Nick, please. Oh, you're very kind, Michelle. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm honored to be here and to share a couple of thoughts. As, as some folks might know, every few years, my friends and I at Asia Partners try to collect some of the things that we've been discussing internally uh, and with our LPs and share it with the broader community. We did it back in 2019. We did it at the beginning of 2021. And what I'd like to share today is a little bit of maybe just a brief update to that. It's not really a, a full uh, kind of new set of thoughts, but we kind of think of it as Windows 3.1, so to speak, uh, inside inside our little firm. And before I jump into that, I talk about technology and what's happening to the capital markets interface with Southeast Asia. I just want to make a point of emphasizing that as much as that's all very interesting, the much, much more important narrative and the much more important set of facts is really what's still happening in terms of the pandemic. I don't want any of my optimism or enthusiasm for tech to take anything away from the human tragedy of that and the enormous heroism of the first responders and the frontline workers that are helping us march through this to get back to a life of normalcy. So let's definitely always keep that in the back of our minds and ground ourselves uh, in that context. Uh, with that in mind, let me just kind of touch upon a couple of core themes this is what we thought back in 2019. We had a couple of core beliefs, which at the time I think were, were mildly contrarian in terms of how the world would likely evolve in Southeast Asia. And as you go through the last few years, we've come to see that some of these have turned out relatively well, and some of them are still, as we had thought, perhaps work in process. I'll just hit a couple of them you know, in sort of very rapid succession. One of our core beliefs is this concept of a golden age, a very unique moment in time, particularly for countries and regions in Asia where large companies get formed. In fact, when you look at China in 2003 to 13, Korea 75 to 86, Japan 1950 to 1960, there were remarkable similarities to Southeast Asia right now. And what do I mean by that? Well, if you look at just a few years back, the total tech market cap of China the total tech market cap of Korea and ditto for Japan, a remarkable proportion of that from a cumulative distribution function perspective are products off the IPOs that took place in this blue zone, plus or minus a few years for each of these respective countries. And a big part of why that's the case is discretionary income is really rising. This is a very unique segment of history for those regions and same for Southeast Asia where uh, wants have not quite become needs yet, and discretionary income is really spiking and growing, and that fuels a tremendous amount of platform foundation and formation in the tech sector. What's sort of interesting as well is to think about what happens after the golden age. The silver age we think of as being roughly where India is right now. The golden age is where we are right now in Southeast Asia. There's a platinum age and a palladium age, not get too cheesy about it. What are the things that change as you go beyond the golden age? And here in Southeast Asia, Malaysia is already in that platinum age in as much as the region as a whole is in the golden age. And Thailand is just on the cusp of getting there, particularly uh, the next couple of years. Well, one of the interesting things that we have found is that when you think about consumer products, there are some very interesting implications that come out of that platinum age and then palladium age. Let me give an example. Beauty exports. It's a top of mind topic for anybody that's in e-commerce, anybody that's in DT, DTC investing. Let me tell you the story of Shiseido. Shiseido is Japan's premier cosmetics company. Their first foray outside of Japan was in roughly 57, 58. And surprise, surprise, they came to Southeast Asia. And then they expanded to Hawaii and America and Europe and ANZ and so on and so forth. And that was precisely when Japan was squarely in what we might loosely call the platinum age, that slab just beyond the slab that Southeast Asia is in right now. And that was really in some ways their key foundational moment of expansion from a cross-border perspective. Why? Because Japan was very aspirational for many, many countries in Southeast Asia and the rest of the world because of its rising affluence and its absolute level of affluence, uh, affluence on an inflation adjusted basis. Guess what? More recently, when Korea was at roughly the same level of affluence that Japan was in the late 1950s, of course, in Korea's case in the 80s, that's when the very first wave of K-beauty began to percolate 
out beyond Korea. The same things are happening at a slightly higher level of affluence with film and music. The very first waves of J-pop, and certainly on an export basis, took place in the 1990s, and now K-pop at a somewhat similar level of affluence, plus or minus a few years, is taking place. The implications are very interesting. One implication is that sea beauty will likely become a very, very big deal. We already see some examples of that and some indications of that through one of our portfolio companies, SCI Commerce. But mark my words, over the next decade or so, sea beauty is going to become an incredibly important global phenomenon following in the same path off Japan and Korea, and of course, on a more global basis, as time goes by, sea pop and sea film uh, already happening. But in terms of the massive saturation of J pop and and uh, and K pop, you'll see similar trends as well. There's also some very interesting implications for how do you price your products and services at different levels here. And what I'm about to describe over here is highly, highly preliminary. You should think of this as kind of coming out of our laboratory. We're still pressure testing some of these ideas, but there are some interesting, if somewhat hesitant conclusions to be able to share with the group. Now, most folks in this audience have heard about the idea of sachet pricing. Sachets are these little tiny packages where you can buy fast moving consumer goods, FMCG, in a relatively small, size. It is the exact diametrical opposite of going to Costco in the US and buying the 30 gallon version of something. This is literally 15 or 20 ml. And it's for obvious reasons. In much of the emerging market world, price points and volumetric points have to be low because the amount of working capital a family has is very low. Now, does it cause environmental damage? It sure does. But it's more affordable as well for middle class families to be able to buy in small quantities uh, over time. One of the really interesting extensions of that concept is sachet pricing for content. And I think one of the great examples of homegrown Asian innovation is the Korean game industry. In fact, it was really Nexon that pioneered in Asia the free to play, but sachet priced, item based priced content model through its game Quiz Quiz back in 1999. Now, technically speaking, Akea in the US, just a couple of years before that, was the first globally to do item-based pricing, but it turned out to be a relatively small game. It was actually Quiz Quiz, and then its successor game by the same director, uh, different format, different genre, Maple Story, that took Asia by storm. The Maple Story dynamic of a free-to-play but item-based game took root very strongly, not just in Korea, but also in China, and then in Southeast Asia over the next several years. And what you see is this very interesting dynamic where these levels of affluence, whether it be sort of over here, or over here, you see a very strong take up of item based pricing for content, just like you have sachet based pricing for FMCG. Now, it's not exactly hard and fast, but we find it fascinating that many of the content businesses in the States at a dramatically different level of affluence tend to be subscription based. And we would hypothesize, and it's very, very rough, and there are exceptions on either side of this, that there's a sort of a transition zone where beyond a certain point of affluence, consumers are actually more likely to pick up a subscription. And that has wonderful dynamics in terms of ARPU and in terms of long-term value of the customer. But it also means that if you're below this zone, you may want to rethink that. Let me give you an example of this. One of the things that's super interesting to look at is how does Netflix price on a global basis? This is the standard subscription price in dollars around the world. And at first glance, you might say, well, yeah, I guess that kind of makes sense. They kind of price a little bit less in India and a little bit more in Germany. It seems plausible. But what's really interesting is if you normalize that against monthly GDP per capita, you see a dramatic difference even though the India price for a standard subscription is only $8.9, that's 4.9% of monthly pre-tax affluence, which is enormous. Whereas, of course, in the developed world, the subscriptions become barnacles on the base of the hull of the ship. They're significantly smaller in terms of the, the load or the burden they put onto you, which sort of, to us, gives us some idea that perhaps there is this concept of a transition zone between item-based pricing and subscription pricing. Now, you might say, well, this is the standard subscription. Come on, it can't, not, not everyone pays that. But the results are actually robust, even when you look at the basic subscription price. It goes from four point something to three point something of monthly income in India. But it gives you a flavor for how 
the item-based to subscription transition may in fact be a thing. And we're struck by the fact that when you look at companies that are very item-based in their heritage and their DNA, Tencent and C, for example, and you compare them to companies that perhaps arrived at item-based pricing a bit later in their development, Activision and EA, for example, there's a remarkable difference in market cap. But more importantly, these companies prove that even in a lower income regime, you can achieve massive amounts of revenue and profitability, but you have to think about pricing differently. We'll just leave you with a little bit of a maybe a question mark in our mind. We're really curious what the implications of this phenomenon are for software, because software as a service, by definition, has been priced on a subscription-like basis, subject to some metering. We're really curious to see whether actually there will be a new generation of SaaS businesses in Southeast Asia and Asia more broadly that take something of a cue from the item-based philosophy. Perhaps it goes back to metered pricing, but there's some sort of logic that suggests that actually these consumer innovations have relevance on the B2B side of things. Let's shift topics. Who will be the next IPOs? My friends at IFC had the great pleasure and the good fortune to be part of one of the initial large cap IPOs from Southeast Asia, but I retired in C largely because I felt that actually we wouldn't be the last one. And my friends and I at Asia Partners really wanted to be great supporters and mentors to the next generation of companies that are coming out of the gates. One way to think about this, and we've shared an earlier version of this in the past, this is kind of up to date, is the journey of IPOs out of China, where over 30 odd years, there's been an extraordinary success of companies approaching the public markets, both stateside and here in Asia. And I think one of the clearest indicators in our mind of what happens in Southeast Asia next is the fact that this chart is by and large replicating itself in Southeast Asia, albeit with a 10 year delay. Now, every once in a while, the, the delay is a lot shorter. The gap between the DD IPO and the grab DSPAC is gonna be measured in quarters, not in years. But in general, there's a good sort of path of data here to suggest that there's a bit of a time lag, but that also gives us a degree of predictability. Because when you look at all the empty rows over here, it gives you a sense for who might come next. Now, in our own region, we've already developed a very large cap company. I'm just so excited and proud to see how well C has done over the last few years. Today, 180 billion plus company and the single highest share price performer among all of the world's large cap, $100 billion public companies. But there's definitely other companies in the wings that are thinking about this. Huge congrats to, to the team at Buka uh, for executing on their IPO a few months ago. And then likewise, several other companies that have been in the news off late in terms of thinking about IPOs, SPAC-wise or, or otherwise. And as you think about who comes next, well, we're a little biased, but we'd certainly ask you to keep an eye on these six companies because what they're doing in terms of filling in some of those gaps is really, really important in terms of core food groups of internet that ultimately have to exist, should exist as independent public companies here in Southeast Asia. Now, one little kind of thing I want to highlight a bit, and I think the Buka IPO really brings this into sharp focus. If you look at the 1990s, really kind of pre the Asian financial crisis, which in many ways was the ASEAN financial crisis of 97, 98, with Korea thrown in as well, it's very interesting to see that actually Indonesian companies raised, you know, about a quarter of the capital they raised in the public markets in America. That dropped to basically zero from 2001 to 2018. Chinese companies actually continued to raise capital in America uh, over the years. And if you limit this to just the technology sector, again, actually more than half of the capital raised by Indonesian tech companies in the 90s was raised from American exchanges that again fell to zero over the 2000s. And a lot of this we think is the unfortunate byproduct of the Asian financial crisis, the somewhat loss of confidence in Southeast Asia by the global capital markets. And I think we look at the Buka IPO and what may end up being a series of additional dual listings, US and Indonesia, and I think we really feel like it's back to the future. This should be happening more and more in the coming years, and we would definitely urge you to keep an eye out for it uh, as, as, as the years go by. Um, the, 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 the concept of Indonesia and how it plays a role in the broader ecosystem is a topic of great interest for us. We have felt that canonically there are two paths to heaven in terms of building a large tech company in Southeast Asia. There are exceptions to this rule, particularly in Vietnam, but in general, there's a strategy one where you focus on Indonesia and a strategy two where you focus on the region, typically from a base in Singapore like C or a base in Kuala Lumpur like Carson. 
And what's sort of interesting about this is that it has persisted over time. We updated some numbers just a few days back. And if you look at all of the roughly Series A and Series B investments in Southeast Asia from 2019 to really just a few days back, yeah, it's, it's kind of in the ballpark of just about 80% of them. Uh, being strategy one or strategy two with a little bit more of a preponderance kind of in a two to one ratio of strategy two versus strategy one. That's been very consistent over the last several years. And part of why we think that a new generation of strategy two companies is developing, meaning multi-country businesses, is an interesting byproduct of education. See, if you want to build a company across Southeast Asia the way we did at Sea or the way Anthony has done at Grab, you need to have leadership from multiple countries that can come together under one roof, not different joint ventures, not different sort of satellite portfolio companies, but a single unified leadership team across Southeast Asia over time, Taiwan, Australia, and so on and so forth. And one of the underappreciated, I think undersung dynamics here is the great importance of international education. When you go abroad, Two things happen. One is you get an education, that, that's fine, that's good. But you also meet a bunch of people. And when you return home, you often found companies. And it's remarkable to see how much China has been a positive beneficiary of this dynamic, sending people abroad to study. They come home often with some ideas swimming in their head, some examples of things that they learned. But most importantly, with a whole bunch of friends who are often part of the Asian Students Association or the Southeast Asian association in the case of ASEAN who come back and this is where you meet your Thai co-founder, your Vietnamese co-founder, your Malaysian co-founder or, or vice versa. And we really want to highlight Vietnam over here. Vietnam has been an absolutely fascinating trajectory. It has increased the number of kids it sends to America for undergraduate by 12x in absolute terms. In fact, Vietnam sends more kids to America to study for college than China does on a per capita basis, which is a really remarkable fact. And given some of the geopolitics that are taking place right now, there's every reason to suggest that actually Vietnam will continue to send kids in increasing numbers uh, as perhaps the mix on this page changes a bit. That's not just true of undergraduates, it's true of graduate students as well, which is very, very powerful, but it's not just America. One of the other, again, underreported and I think also underappreciated stories in Southeast Asia is the fact that Australian universities are also great places to meet people. The team at VNG, uh, who's built a great business, met uh, primarily around Australian uh, uh, higher education. In fact, if you think about just these companies over here, there tends to be, with the exception of the American businesses, a slightly higher number of employees from Australian universities than from American universities. And when you broaden out to look at uh, Britain as well, in general, you see a really interesting cluster of people that have come back to Southeast Asia and learning. And we would expect that Chinese universities and others will grow over time uh, on this list. Worth emphasizing because the sociology of how teams come together is unbelievably important. And again, it was an important part of C's journey. It was an important part of Grab's journey, an important part of the NG's journey as well. Um, one of the interesting things, though, is that a lot of those folks that have international exposure often do a sojourn in Singapore, and not just folks that are from the region that studied abroad and came back as sea turtles, but also folks from around the world. And the data is becoming increasingly clear that Singapore is, is really the de facto commercial capital of Asia. This has a very interesting implication. You know, as the old story goes, when the air conditioner was invented, the most money got made by the property developers who built multi-dwelling units in hot cities. When dense wave division multiplexing was invented, a lot of money got made by Indian outsourcing firms like Genpact and Dutch, who basically were able to capitalize on dramatically falling international long distance charges to be able to do voice based communication with the West. And if you see a chart like this, what's the implication for us? It's software. We think that 90% of software, 80% of software is sold, not bought. Of course, you're going to buy Windows. when it's to sell it to you. It's the standard. But most software isn't a standard per se. You have to be sold it. You have to be convinced to buy it. And when you have this many Asia PAC business decision makers, it's a really interesting place to build software companies because you can bounce around Singapore and in a week 
meet a whole bunch of people that could be potential buyers of your software on an APAC wide basis. This is in some ways the logical implication and consequence of the work that Philip Yeo did many years ago to build Singapore into a global hub for, for regional headquarters or APAC headquarters and that you're definitely going to see, I think, turn into software companies here in Southeast Asia. In fact, we would say informally that if there weren't five or six billion dollar value software companies out of Singapore for the next decade, we'd be very surprised. That seems to be a very logical path for Singapore to take, specifically because of this chart. Uh, let's talk about capital. Let's talk about availability of capital. In, in previous years, we've tried to segment the market between China, India, Indonesia, and the rest of Southeast Asia, and of course, these collectively being Southeast Asia. And to be very precise about it, in almost the same way that Procter & Gamble or Unilever would segment their customer, I think it's very important to be very precise. Let's look at one to $20 million rounds 20 to 100 million dollar rounds and 100 million dollar rounds and get all for private companies in tech you think about what happened in 2020 it was very different in terms of the supply of capital the deployment of capital we've updated these numbers as additional data have sort of come through and the numbers have been refined a bit so this is the slight update for what we shared a little while ago in china it was uniformly a great time to be an entrepreneur in 2020. The supply of capital was dramatically greater than it was in previous years. In fact, on the higher end of the scale, it was really, really good to be an entrepreneur. In India, it was a little bit more mixed. If you were raising a very small check, it was a tough time to be an entrepreneur, sort of flat in the middle and a great time to be, for example, selling shares in, in, in Geo, if you were Mukesh Ambani. But look at Southeast Asia. Again, this is 2019 evolving into 2020. Small checks, about flat, kind of like India in the middle zone. Large checks, not bad, good time to raise capital, and a massive, massive decline in the mid-size of the market, which really was a challenge for companies. This was the proverbial Series C and Series D gap. And it's worth mentioning that in 2019, there was already a gap in terms of supply relative to the demand, and that just fell in absolute terms as well in 2020. Now, what has happened in 2021? Well, we're, you know, almost nine months in of complete now. We can, we can have a little bit of a rough sense, but here's the data for 2029. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, before I get there, forgive me. This is the data for 2020 versus 19. If we isolate and segment Southeast Asia into Indonesia versus X Indonesia, Southeast Asia. And again, what you can see is a broadly consistent pattern. With that as context, let me jump to the next page, which is interesting. This is 2021 versus 2019 to sort of show two somewhat normalized years versus each other, recognizing that 2020 was very challenging for some parts, not China, but other parts of Asia. And what you see is that 2021 has been booming in China across the board. India has been relatively robust as well, except for that smaller end. Uh, Indonesia is really interesting, absolutely booming in the mid market, in that kind of series C and D stage. We've been part of that with our Gudangada investment, but many others as well. And then Southeast Asia, ex Indonesia, while there has been a modest lift of 14% over two years, there's still a very significant gap because a 14% lift just puts a small dent in what was already a pretty large gap in 2019. So there remains a very interesting CD gap in ex Indonesia, Southeast Asia, but Indonesia is quite simply on fire right now. And you see it in the data. Here's 2018, 19, 2021 for small checks. Here's 18, 19, 2021 for medium sized checks for the overall region and then large checks. And then again, when you isolate out Indonesia, you see this enormous, enormous surge of deployment in that mid size zone, Gurangada, Bukalapak pre IPO, Halodoc are just some of the more notable names on this list, but Indonesia has been completely on fire. Whereas Southeast Asia, ex-Indonesia, really interesting. I mean, the 2021 kind of CD gap really hasn't filled in very much relative to what you saw in previous years, which we find very, very interesting. Just finally shifting gears into a few closing thoughts. You know, we continue to, 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 to wonder a little bit about the fixation with being a unicorn. As many folks on this call know, and as my sort of painting behind me sort of amply sort of uh, demonstrates, we're much bigger fans of the rhino concept. The tough, skinned, humble, practical, 
very commercially oriented founder who does want to get to a billion dollar valuation but aspires to do so on a PE multiple or an EBITDA multiple. And when you think about why that's so important, I want to contextualize it a little bit with two ways. The first is to talk a little bit about where we are in the overall capital market cycle. Warren Buffett is a great metric. It's one of the best ways to look at the markets. He says, take the market cap of a country or a region and divide it by the respective GDP. If you do this for just America, it's a little misleading because America has a lot of market cap from its international companies' operations, Google abroad, Boeing abroad, Microsoft abroad, and so on and so forth. But if you look at it on a planet-wide basis as we have on this page, well, it's pretty much a closed system until Elon gets to Mars. This is pretty much a completely enclosed economic environment. And yeah, so here's the long-term pattern of total global market cap. We're currently at 119 trillion. Here's the long-term pattern of global GDP. And guess what? We are at the highest ratio in recent history, much higher than the very peak before the global financial crisis hit. Now, some may argue, well, gosh, you're thinking about this the wrong way, Nick. You should look at this on a forward basis because, of course, market valuations look to the future. So we've done that as well. This is the ratio looking at next year's GDP using the IMF forecast for the world. Again, it's a very high point. And you see this little kind of chart over here on the left-hand side, and I've drawn sort of a trend line, this gray line. What I'm going to show you next is how much above or below the long-term trend line of roughly 8.6% per year of global market cap are we? And that's what this chart is, which is really interesting. Uh, we are roughly 28% ahead of the global trend line in the capital markets. And one interesting thing, just like in physics, Hooke's law, you pull a spring a certain amount, it's going to whipsaw in the other direction by just about as much of a distance. 49, 44, 28, 28. We're just kind of interested to see how this all turns out. It could very well keep rising, don't get me wrong but it tends to flex back the other way sooner or later. And we're keeping our eyes on that right now. Again, in Southeast Asia, there continues to be a very interesting gap in C and D, particularly for ex-Indonesia, Southeast Asia businesses. But on a global basis, it's fair to say that things are, are not cheap right now and that it has every possibility of hooks lawing itself back this way. And you might ask yourself, well, if that's the case, if we're actually gonna whipsaw ourselves back to the other side of this line and there'll be sort of a, a correction event where is the safest place to be? We were curious about this. So we looked at the three years from January 2000 to December 2002. So 2000, 2001, 2002. The three years from January 2008 to December 2010, 2008, 2009, 2010. And we looked at how many companies in the world that were public above a de minimis market cap, 500 million, let's call it, achieved at least a 30% IRR over a sustained three-year period. And it turns out that in the dot-com recession, you know, despite the fact that a lot of American companies eroded in value, there were 68 companies that had at least a 30% IRR. China was next, and then it sort of trickled down. What was really interesting about the GFC was that China took the number one spot, but Indonesia was on the list, Thailand, Taiwan, a much broader set of emerging markets continued to generate value. We're really curious if a correction comes, which countries will be most represented. And we'd make a strong argument that Southeast Asia will be amply represented on this list of companies that, despite a correction, continue to generate meaningful shareholder value. Finally, back to this concept of rhinos, not unicorns, we continue to be just so impressed by entrepreneurs that do a lot with a little. And it's not because it's academically interesting or sort of, you know, sort of theoretically interesting. It's because 70% of the world's most successful tech companies of all time in internet and software, I, I haven't puts hard by this list, and we could add that at some point, spent less than $100 million total to get to cash flow positive. Cash flow positive. So we see companies raising billions of dollars, and we wonder, look, that's a great strategy. And again, 30% on this list did that, and were very successful, like C, like Amazon, like Meituan. But we have a special admiration for those that are able to do a lot with a little, like the Garena business within C that raised only $17 million before turning a profit. So we just leave this final chart for the group's benefit to take a look at, because at the end of the day, what really matters is what you do with what you have. And I think that the new generation of entrepreneurs that come out of potential correction will be incredibly attuned to that capital productivity and frugality. With that, Thank you all so much for your time. We wish you and your families just good health and, uh, and safety these next few, few quarters. And uh, we're always here to chat if you want to debate and then bounce around some ideas with us.
Talk to you all soon. Bye-bye.